Rook piercings, pros, cons, advantages, disadvantages. I'm also going to talk about um, what you should know beforehand, the piercing experience, healing the piercing, living with the piercing, jewelry, and what happens if you get tired of it and decide you don't want it anymore. Coming up next on Pros and Cons by a Piercer, Season 2, Episode number 12, so you may want to stick around. For those that are new to the channel, first off, welcome. Glad to have you here. Uh, but you may not know who I am. My name is Davo. I'm a professional body piercer and have been since 1994. I own and operate the Axiom Body Piercing Studio located here in bitterly cold Des Moines, Iowa, inside Skin Kitchen Tattoo. So when I talk to you about these things, I'm talking to a level of expertise that comes from being in the body piercing industry for well over 26 years. So we're going to talk about rook piercings today. I'm going to give you the pros and cons and et cetera. Uh, for those who don't know what a rook piercing is, of course, I'm going to put up a photo. But uh, it is in the anti-helix, which is that ridge that goes to the inside of your ear all the way up to the top. Underneath that flap thing, there's a ridge that continues. It's usually done right about there where, you, where it kind of juts out a little bit. Um, done with rings, uh, possibly, but more commonly with curved barbells. Now, it's a misconception that this somehow goes through the back of the ear and out the front. It actually usually doesn't. What it does is it just goes through that ridge of thick cartilage that's right there. Now, as far as the history of this piercing, it pretty much uh, is a modern piercing. Uh, prior to 1990, I have not seen any documentation that states that this was done by any indigenous people or tribal people or prehistoric people or anybody. Uh, it was first introduced by Eric Dakota in 1992 in Body Play magazine and one other magazine that featured a lot of uh, new ear piercings, including the industrial and the Dave piercing. Now, there, uh, w the name, it's kind of one of those things. And whether or not Dakota was, uh, Eric Dakota was the first person to do it, who knows? Probably not, but the He's the one that popularized it and got his name out there. So, like, I've heard everything from that's somehow a shortening of his name, and I don't know how Rook came from Eric Dakota. That makes no sense to me. Uh, the only other reference, Rook is a bird in the crow family, and it does kind of look like, uh, you know, maybe some uh, birds sitting on, like if you did multiple ones, kind of like, uh, you know, kind of birds sitting on a branch or a uh, – telephone wire so maybe that's where the name came from i don't know it's called a rook okay with the basic understanding of where it came from what it is and etc let's move on to the pros the advantages the things that about this piercing that do make it uh something you want to do starting with number one it just seems to fit very very well into the anatomy of the ear that area kind of calls out for it if it's done well it will match that anatomy and look very 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 normal and almost like it belongs there number two it does have a long history of healing it heals fairly quickly by comparison to some other piercings however it can be a difficult heal i wouldn't say it's an easy heal to say the least but it is one of those piercings that is going to heal it's not experimental and you probably are not going to have a whole load of problems but we'll get into some of those issues later on it is a very unique piercing it is not very common uh i would say hey it's not something you're going to see all the time it kind of goes through these little phases where it seems like it gets popular for about a month or two and then all those people talk about how hard it is to heal it and then it goes away again then it comes back again uh basically this piercing is not something you're going to see very often um it's kind of a rarity and kind of uh, exotic in a way number four this piercing has a long history of healing uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is not experimental. It had people have been healing this out at least since the early 90s. That's over 30 years. Yeah, 30 years approximately that people have been getting this piercing and healing it out. So it's not something where it's like, oh, yeah, it might work. It might not. Number five, there is a large variety of different styles of jewelry. Yes, uh, you're kind of stuck with rings or curved barbells, but 
those two particular styles of jewelry have various different ends, types, colors, etc. A lot of things to choose from, including the material that's actually uh, the jewelry is made out of. Now, before I move on to the cons, if you like the video, give us a thumbs up. Let me know that you liked it, because I like it when you like it. If you haven't already, please subscribe, hit that notification bell so that you're notified every single time we post a video. Now, let's move on to the cons, the disadvantages, the things that make you go, eh, maybe this really isn't for me. Starting with number one, <laughs> has to be isolated. Uh, There's a common one with ear piercings, but this one, so the top of the ear, it gets a lot of contact, a lot of bumping. It comes in contact with pretty much any headgear that you're going to wear. It is something that's going to be difficult to isolate. You can't sleep on it. You can't do any of these other things. It really, really needs that. The reason why this piercing has a reputation of being a hard or difficult heel at times is because people do not fully understand that regardless of how it feels, contact with the piercing, trauma with the piercing is going to cause issues. Number two, limited to pretty much two styles of jewelry, either circular jewelry or a curved barbell. Often, depending on your anatomy, you may be stuck with just a curved barbell. It may be the only thing that works for you. So you're kind of locked into that style of jewelry regardless of what your dreams or ambitions may be. Number three, this is a piercing that is notorious for closing pretty rapidly. You do want to leave the jewelry in at all times. It's not something you can take out for a couple days or go to a basketball game and, you know, take it out for a couple hours, whatever you need to do. It's probably going to close. So you need to leave that jewelry in at all times. Number four, not everybody has the anatomy for this piercing. You have to have a pronounced ridge. It has to be big enough to support the jewelry in the piercing. If it isn't, it shouldn't be done and will probably reject. Uh, it's very anatomy specific. No way around it. You either have it or you don't. Number five, this can affect whether or not you can wear headphones, helmets, safety gear, anything that covers the ear, even after the piercing is healed. Uh, pressure on the area, trauma on the area can cause this one to flare up even years after its initial healing. Uh, it's really something you want to consider, especially if you're involved with any type of activities that involve headgear. Now we're going to move on to things you should know. But before we do that, check out our merch store. Uh, link is in the description. Lots of T-shirts, lots of all kinds of everything you can possibly imagine in various different designs and colors. Uh, links in the description. There's also one of those merch bars. So now, let's move on to things you should look for. Things that you should consider before getting it done or kind of leading up to getting it done. The first thing is you want to find a piercer that's professional, informative, willing to educate you, that you feel comfortable with, that offers a consultation, that covers the risks and what it's going to take to heal it, and all the stuff you should know beforehand so that you can make an educated decision on whether or not this piercing is right for you. During the consultation, the piercer should evaluate the area to determine whether or not it can be pierced or not. I Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. The only way you know is to actually look at the area, feel around, and all that stuff we do. I uh, Just taking you in and putting you in the chair and having at it without even looking at the area that's not a situation you want because that person probably is just more interested in the coin that you're going to put in their pocket. Next one, uh, they should suggest a curved barbell over a ring for the initial piercing. Um, it's my experience. They heal a lot easier and a lot more quickly with a curved barbell than they do with rings. There are some cases where because of the shape of the rook, a ring is maybe a better option, but it's really kind of a rarity. In most cases, the curved barbell is your best option uh, for the initial piercing, and it should be oversized, meaning it should be longer than needed to allow for inflammation and swelling because this piercing can swell. The next thing you want to look for is do they provide aftercare instructions? Do they do it verbally? Do they offer a video? Do they give you written instructions? Do they list the jewelry size and type and et cetera on it? These are important things to know beforehand so that you know what you're getting yourself into and how to properly take care of it. Do they, uh, the other thing you want to ask them is if they provide aftercare product or sell aftercare product. Um, or if they don't, where you can pick it up. Sometimes it's better to do that beforehand 
um, instead of running around with this uh, fresh piercing and dealing with trying to find something. So uh, be prepared is what I'm getting at. And if they, uh, they have it for sale or they just throw it in with the piercing, even better. The last thing is, and I've already kind of touched on this already, is you should consider how often you wear helmets, safety gears, anything that goes over the ear, over the ear headphones, etc. anything that's going to have contact with the piercing. If you do those things a lot, it might be something that you want to consider not getting done, or you may want to consider making sure that you get it done during a break from those for those types of activities. Now let's talk about the piercing experience itself. Generally, what will happen is you go through a waiver. They go through, well, they go through the consultation. Then you go through a waiver. They pick out the jewelry. They show you what they're going to do it with. And then they start setting up. Once they're set up, they'll disinfect the area um, to, uh, with a surgical scrub. Mark the piercing area. Have you take a look at it. I'm a big fan of uh, you, you never want to get a piercing without looking at the placement. Uh, there are some piercings where, regardless, it's going to be where it is, like navel piercings, usually nipple piercings. But with ear piercings or facial piercings where there are possibilities of different uh, locations, you always want to look at the mark. Um, this one can be hard to see. Trying the two-mirror trick may be your best option. Or pull out your cell phone, turn on the camera, take a video or take a picture of it. Or hand it to the, the piercer or somebody with you and have them do it. Now, when you're marking, if you are planning on getting additional piercings in that area, you do want to mention that to your piercer because it's easier to kind of space that out and leave room now than it is to come back later and try to find room. The piercing location decided, they'll put you in a rec uh, reclined position usually. Some people do them sitting up. This is a freehand piercing, usually done using a needle, a cork, and a needle receiving tube um, or just a needle receiving tube. Uh, some piercers do this with curved bar or curved needles. Some don't. I personally don't like the curved needles because I don't feel like I have as much control. Uh, there's also the hook needles that are bent uh, prior to the piercing being done. Whatever works for them best is probably what they're going to use. Um, it's not really going to make that much of a difference one way or another in my opinion, but that that said some people do it that way and some people do it the other way they may use a guide pin or taper pin to get the jewelry in usually the part of this piercing that takes the longest is actually guiding the jewelry in and getting the the closure on sometimes it can be it can take a few minutes depending on the type of closure if it's threaded or if it's uh, not for or if it's threadless i uh, basically you should be patient uh, you might notice a little bit of bleeding afterwards. That's normal. Um, it's not something to be concerned about. It usually lasts a few minutes at tops um, and usually is not really that profuse. It's going to be really common to have uh, throbbing, aching, tenderness of the touch, uh, maybe some heat immediately after the piercing is done. That usually fades in a few minutes, but uh, that's normal. Uh, it is going to be tender to the touch, redness, discolorization, heat, um, or feels inflamed or feverish, that can last three to five days, sometimes a little bit longer. This piercing is prone to grumpiness, so yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be tender and it's not gonna like contact. But go back to what I'm. Well, I'll get into this in a second, but isolation is very important with this piercing. All right, now let's get into healing. Uh, average healing time, 12 to 16 weeks, sometimes longer. It really it varies greatly from person to person. During that period, it's going to be an open wound, and it's going to need to be cleaned twice daily using a sterile saline solution. You also want to practice cross-contamination prevention. Common sense things like washing your hands before you handle it. No oral contact or exchanging of bodily fluids on you around the piercing. Keeping your environment clean, clothing, bedding, towels. Not submerging the piercing in bodies of water you cannot control the quality of, which is everything but your own clean bathtub. Keep pets away from it. Don't let them sleep in the bed with you. Keep wet hair away from the area. Make sure that it's dry. Also, I would really suggest pretty much keeping hair away from it, no way around it. Um, also, uh, avoid contact with unclean objects. Uh, headphones, telephones, etc. should be avoided until the piercing has gone through its initial healing phase. 
isolate the piercing. I don't know how else to say that, but uh, don't put anything near it. It doesn't like contact. It doesn't like trauma. You're going to find even after the piercing is healed, it doesn't like trauma. Do not sleep on the piercing. It's mainly the number one cause of trauma and issues with cartilage piercings. This is no different than any other one. In fact, it's probably more prone to acting up to uh, any type of trauma or pressure. So do not sleep on it and avoid contact as much as possible. As I mentioned before, uh, you're going to see some slight bleeding, sometimes anywhere from one to five days. Usually it's kind of collects around the piercing holes. Don't pick at it. Don't try to get it off there. It's just like a scab. The more you pick at it, the, the worse things are going to get. Uh, also, redness, discolorization, heat, tenderness to touch, that's all normal reactions. Swelling is a normal reaction. That will subside. If it doesn't subside, you need to see your piercer, especially if it's a situation where it seems like it's swelling beyond the length of the jewelry. Very important to contact your piercer and have a longer piece in put in as soon as possible. Avoid contact, avoid wearing helmets, headgear, anything that puts pressure on the piercing during the healing process. Um, also make sure anything that comes in contact with the area is disinfected on a regular basis. This one isn't affected as much by uh, mass, but... Uh, it's probably a good idea to change them on a regular basis. Also, avoid things that are constrictive or cause pressure on the area until it's completely healed. And sometimes those masks are just too tight. Uh, if it is, try either getting the clips for the back of the head or the type of mask that has one single loop that goes around your entire head. Now, jewelry. Um, jewelry, it's, if it's loose, it should be changed as soon as the piercing is healed completely. Uh, you don't want to have longer or jewelry that's too long or too, uh, too loose because it's going to be more likely to get caught and snagged on things. The lower the profile, the tighter it is to your body, the less problems you're going to see in the future. Uh, the first time you change it, it's always a good idea to have a professional do it. Um, they're skilled at it. You're not. And it's going to make your life a lot easier, especially getting the ends on, because it can be complicated with this particular piercing. When choosing the size of the jewelry, it should be tight enough that it looks right and feels right, but not so tight that it causes discomfort. I always use the jeans um, example. It should be tight enough that it looks right and looks good, but not so tight that you can't breathe. So usually about a sixteenth or maybe two or three millimeter, I'll one or two millimeters is usually a good idea to have that much play you are a human body you do expand and contract you're not always the same size so having a little bit of room is a good thing avoid uh barbells that have sharp edges points uh the ends mainly uh things dangling off of it etc anything that might get caught on clothing or bedding because it probably will get caught on clothing and bedding and it's not going to feel good Always, when buying threaded jewelry, buy internally threaded. Do not buy externally threaded. Internally threaded is a sign that it is a better piece of jewelry and it's going to cause less damage uh, to the piercing. When you take the jewelry in and out, usually it takes more turns to tighten and loosen. It is just better in the long run. If you're not going to get threaded jewelry, then threadless jewelry is your best other option. Um, and that's basically kind of internally threaded too. Lastly, on jewelry, if you are going to wear a ring in it, if you like that look and you want to go for that eventually, I would suggest waiting until the piercing is completely seasoned, meaning it's healed, give it about six months to a year to the point where it's not going to react poorly to an increase in that curvature or the added movement or contact. Uh, if you do put a ring in and, and it starts flaring up suddenly, immediately go back to the barbell as soon as possible. Give it more time and hopefully it'll improve. The thing is, the ring has to be large enough to allow for the curvature and not to put a lot of pressure on the piercing and cause issues. Let's talk a little bit about living with the piercing. Jewelry needs to be stay in at all times. I already mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. Leaving the jewelry out for extended periods of time, regardless of how long you've had it or how old it is, is probably going to cause the piercing to close. So leave the jewelry in. Also, avoid trauma, pressure, and et cetera, contact on the piercing. I don't understand why people think that after a piercing can heal or is healed, you can do anything you want to it. You still have a hard metal object Inside soft tissue, trauma, bending, pulling, yanking, knocking is going to cause issues even in a healed piercing, including damaging the piercing and starting the whole healing process all over again. 
understand no matter how well it heals, you may never be able to sleep on that ear again. You may always have to elevate it. Um, it's not uncommon with cartilage piercings. I have them for 10, 15, 20 years. And if you sleep on them wrong, the next day they flare up and you have issues. This is especially true if you decide that you want to wear a ring in the piercing. You are going to probably want to figure out a way to either sleep on the other side or elevate it off the bed. Lastly, uh, do test whenever you're purchasing uh, headphones, earphones, or headbuds, any uh, helmets, etc. Kind of test whether or not it's going to cause a lot of pressure or trauma to the piercing. Um, it just it's it's a fact of life. You now have that piercing there, and it is not going to react well to certain things. You have altered your body, so take that into account when you're purchasing new stuff. Lastly, abandoning the piercing. What happens if you get sick of it and you try to and you're like I'm done with this and take it out? Uh, basically, if you remove the jewelry, uh, if it's already healed. There's really nothing you need to do. If it hasn't healed yet, you do want to basically keep an eye on it and treat it like any other wound in your body. Keep the area clean. Avoid contact if anything is contaminated and give it time to close. Um, if you've healed the piercing out, you'll probably be left with uh, two indentations on both sides. And it may appear that the hole is still or is still open. Uh the reason why is that piercings uh, heal over when they do heal over. They heal over in the center by squeezing that tissue back together and reconnecting it and then slowly fill in outward. So a lot of times the piercing will appear open, but the fact is in the center of it, it is closed. Over the years, your body will increase the amount of tissue, fill it up, and it'll get to the point where it's, it looks semi-normal like normal tissue and won't look so much like a piercing. However, you may be stuck with two indentation scars on both sides regardless of what happens. Now, uh, sometimes these holes, as they're filling up, will collect this stuff that's kind of a cream cheese looking substance. Has a very distinct odor to it and basically what it is is sebum. It is a natural product to your body. Uh, it's what keeps your skin moisturized waterproof, etc. It can be kind of waxy, and it'll collect inside piercings sometimes. For some reason, it seems to produce more around scar tissue. At least that's the theory. Now, uh, sometimes when you squeeze these old piercings that have been empty for a while, the stuff will come out. It is completely normal. Don't worry about it. it. It's not an infection. It's not any other problem. Uh, just clean off the area, and you'll be fine. Well, that's it. That's all I have to say about rook piercings today. I hope you found this informative. Um, if I missed something or I brought up a question or you have an unrelated question, feel free to leave a comment. I try to keep up with them when I can. And till next time, here's hoping all your piercings heal with ease and without a single issue. And if you're in the Des Moines, Iowa area, I hope to see you for your body piercing needs in the future. Have a good day, everybody. Take care. Stay warm. Uh, stay healthy. Stay safe. And we will see you in the next video.